15 years ago, my right hip became so painful that I had difficulty pursuing my avocational passion, which is riding my bicycle over long distances, ice, snow, road, mountain. So I elected to have my right hip replaced. Twelve years ago, I was in existential crisis because I had just rock-starred a hotel room. This was a problem because I wasn't Freddie Mercury. I was a 51-year-old surgeon with a passion for fixing neglected fractures in Africa. And that's why I was in the Tri-Cities areas of Washington in the proximity of the storied Hanford reactor to give a presentation on our experience in starting a sign nail program in Liberia. I wrote on the ceiling, the walls, and the bathroom mirror, multimedium. I used pencil, I used pen, blue and black ink, a rainbow of highlighter colors, and even shaving cream. That was a multimedium part. But it was a, for me, it was a simultaneous epiphany and mental meltdown. And the uh, whole environmental circumstance of where that occurred was kind of ironic. Um, but what I wrote was that I believe there was some form of evil syndicate consisting of the corporations that manufacture and market joint replacement parts, the orthopedic surgeons that collaborate with them to promote and pitch these parts and convince rank-and-file orthopedic surgeons like myself that this is the newest, latest, greatest thing and we should use it, and the FDA. And this evil syndicate was responsible for the heavy metal poisoning of potentially millions of Americans with at least the 10 million Americans that have had artificial joint replacements done in the past 30, 40 years, uh, potentially at risk. But some specific patients, such as myself with a particular type of hip, uh, at very high risk. I believed in the syndicate because um, for the six months before my meltdown, so starting a year after my hip was replaced, a series of things were happening to my health. First, I developed maddening tinnitus ringing in my ears and high-frequency hearing loss. I couldn't hear the birds sing. Then on my mission trips to Liberia, Uganda, and Kenya, when I got in the hot tropics, my armpits look like a baboon's butt. And for those of you who don't know what a baboon's butt looks like, it was a really, really bad rash. And I was a little bit unusual as an orthopedic surgeon because before I did orthopedic residency, I had a year of formal training in internal medicine and then four years of general medical training in the Indian Health Service before I ever started orthopedics. And I was kind of scratching my head and I also knew that I had a particular type of hip called a metal-on-metal -metal hip that used a cobalt ball rubbing on a cobalt socket, which was supposed to be the bee's knees for me uh, as a high-demand athlete because a large head gives you better stability. But I'd kind of been worried right along about this particular design that it might elevate the levels of heavy metals in the blood, specifically cobalt. So before I melted down, I'd already been checking my blood and urine cobalt levels, and they were absolutely through the roof. Um, and I was also aware that heavy metal poisoning causes psychosis. And I was aware that I was becoming psychotic. And this whole episode near the Hanford reactor, I just thought I had to get it out. Uh, I thought I had to leave a message to the world this was happening because I knew I was losing it. And that's literally what I wrote everywhere, was that uh, cobalt poisoning exists, it may be common, it was happening to me. And I'd been communicating with the company that made my hip, Johnson & Johnson, 
their design engineers, the surgeons that were promoting the device, and their salespeople, and telling them this. And they weren't inclined to listen to me. They seemed to be willfully blind to the problem. Fortunately for my professional career, uh, what happened in Hanford stayed in Hanford. My containment vessel of family and friends came around me. Uh, I was started on mood stabilizer medications. Understandably, my family and friends and medical providers, given the circumstances of what happened uh, in, uh, in that hotel room, felt that uh, my fixation on cobalt was delusional, even though I'd been checking my cobalt and I knew it was high. I said, Steve, you know, you're having an atypical presentation of bipolar disorder. This is a manic phase. Take your medications, be a good boy, get on with life. And that's what I did. Uh, and the medications were effective at putting a lid on it. And for the next two years, I suffered. Uh, my cobalt levels started going up. My balance and coordination deteriorated to the point where I had to stop mountain biking uh, because I, I kept on crashing. I developed headaches. I lost 15 pounds. I continued to have the bad rashes. I developed a tremor, fortunately, in my non-dominant right hand. And my frantic mania devolved into a listless suicidal depression which resulted in another three months of absolute disability as my cobalt levels peaked at 122 times the known safe threshold in industry. And all during this time, I'm calling up my buddies who are pitching this device for Johnson & Johnson saying, hey, maybe you shouldn't be putting these in people anymore. I think it's really making me sick. And they're continuing to insist, oh, cobalt's not toxic. And none of the other 90,000 patients that have been implanted with the same model of hip that you have had are having your problems. Um, I also started having increasing pain at my hip, and the hip would grind with every step. Stealth was impossible. I couldn't sneak up on anybody. Uh, not that I really wanted to. Um, but finally, uh, after another two years, at 42 months of time in my body, the hip had to come out. It was, we had the imaging that showed I definitely had a problem at the hip. Uh, I had actually started to develop both thyroid and heart failure. And another thing that was kind of the last straw is I developed a blind spot right here. And when I went out after dark, instead of missing words when I was reading something, I would get a flashing light. And that's a classic sign that my eyeballs were getting disconnected from my brain. And I knew enough about neurology and medicine from my background to realize, yeah, Steve, you're really being poisoned. Uh, and at this point, my blood cobalt level was 122. The safe threshold in industry is one part per billion. I was over 100 times that. And still, everybody I was talking to says, oh, yeah, cobalt's actually good for you. We think it increases your athletic performance. It doesn't. In 1981, Smith and Carson edited Trace Elements in the Environment, Volume 6, Cobalt, 1981. One, and it was commissioned by the federal government. 1,000 pages of science and references describing exactly what I was going through. Historically, in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, they added cobalt pills were used to treat anemia. And those patients developed surprise, deafness, blindness, numbness, weakness, heart, and thyroid failure. Breweries in the 60s and 70s added cobalt to beer. Has a number of heavy imbibers in certain cities where this was done, there were epidemics of these guys dying from heart failure. And they also were developing thyroid failure. Then in 1975, the year I graduated from West Anchorage High School, Dr. Jones, uh, a renowned orthopedic surgeon at Hospital for Special Surgery, 
noted that his patients with the metal-on-metal -metal hip like I had of that day, a prior model, which was how my hip got on the market. The way the whole market thing works with medical devices, the companies don't have to test them. They only have to show it somehow resembles something that had been marketed before, even if the pre preceding device had failed miserably, as the mckee Farah hip had done which was the one that Dr. Jones described, but his patients were developing the same problems I experienced at the hip, and they, some of them died from complications of the redo surgery, and Dr. Jones was pretty forward-leaning. At autopsy, he sampled, uh, I believe, brain, heart, kidneys, and liver, and found elevated cobalt in all those organs. So it was very clear that this material gets freely disseminated throughout uh, the body. Cobalt, iron, and titanium are the base metals of joint replacement. My hip used a cobalt ball rubbing on a cobalt socket. Actually, it's cobalt chromium alloy, but more than 50% was cobalt. And cobalt is what made me sick. Only 10% of these metal-on-metal -metal hips, which were very popular, about one-third of the market in 2006 when I had mine done, only 10% have been recalled, those that were exactly like mine, the 90,000. And one of the big reasons they were recalled was me, because um, uh, I wrote a paper about it and we got it published. Um, when I had my hip redone, I convinced my anesthesia colleague, Dr. Monroe, to do a spinal, which he was with me in Africa, and we like spinal anesthetics in Africa because they're very simple. But that allowed my, my CSF, cerebral spinal fluid, we collected a sample. We sent it for a cobalt level. My level was the third highest ever reported for cobalt in the fluid that bathes the spinal cord and the brain. The two patients that had higher levels than I had were profoundly deaf, blind, and numb. They had severe peripheral neuropathy. So I was actually very fortunate that I wasn't as badly involved as I could have been. My, this is what the surfaces of my joint look like. Uh, we know this, we have this picture because since I started my private practice in 1992, I've sent every failed joint part I've sent, taken out of anybody to uh, the bioengineers at Dartmouth. And they analyze it, and we've learned tons from that. I, I believe that should be the standard. Uh, a hospital, uh, if a hospital failed to send a tumor biopsy to pathology, if they lost it or just neglected to have it looked at, they'd be negligent. But most hospitals just throw these parts away when they come out uh, and when they failed. But you can see under intense magnification here, the surfaces were not polished, which was what the theory would say, but they looked like they'd been ground. And they, at Dartmouth, they were able to measure the amount of missing metal. It was supposed to wear in microns, which is very, very small. Mine wore in millimeters, 1,000 times as much as it should have, in only 42 months. We had a patient of mine, the Bill Morris. He was the other uh, individual in my case report. Uh, this is 2010. I'm making some progress with getting this known with my colleagues through the publication of a case report, but it's actually attracting more attention uh, in the popular press. And the other subject of the report, Bill, his picture's in the New York Times holding his failed ASR hip, which is the same hip I had. Uh, and it was uh, a, a pretty big story. There was a number of uh, publications on that. And that exposure is what put pressure on Johnson & Johnson to recall my particular model of hip. At the time my case report came out and got published in America's most known orthopedic journal, my kind of professional organization, trade union, is called the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons. 
president and vice president were both design surgeons for Johnson & Johnson. And they, in combination with Dr. Schmalzerid, who is the primary pitch person for the particular model of my hip, aggregately those guys have been paid in the neighborhood of $50 million. Million dollars here, million dollars there. Pretty soon you're talking some real money. But anyway, you know, these, uh, this organization, the presidential line of my professional organization, which I formerly had a great deal of respect for, they actually commissioned a commentary on the case report, my report and bills, saying that we don't think this is happening. It, it was highly skeptical. Uh, then, another interesting thing was, at the same time, the CDC wanted to disseminate this case report through one of their publications so the public and all the doctors in practice would be aware and the FDA blocked them from doing that. So something is kind of crazy here. Now, in my practice, I've got 100 patients with unsafe cobalt levels from wear or corrosion of cobalt joint parts. Most have a plastic socket rather than a cobalt one. And some have replaced shoulders or knees rather than hips. Many have some of my symptoms. Fortunately, I eventually met this guy, Dr. Bridges, and we determined that we could do brain scans on my patients with elevated cobalt levels. The scans use a color scale. The cooler colors, the blues, represent that the brain isn't using glucose as quickly as it ought to. Black is normal, so a normal brain would scan entirely black. All our patients have blue brains. We've now scanned 80 patients with uh, elevated levels of cobalt. They all have blue brains. So if you take what I know and you extrapolate it to the American population of 10 million patients with a joint replacement, there's probably at least a million Americans that are significantly ill from cobalt toxicity. I come here today to recall cobalt joint replacement parts because the syndicate will not. Cobalt's fundamentally toxic. It should never be implanted in the human body. The problem is fundamental. It's regulation. Thank you for your attention.